All right. Okay. Good evening, everyone. Um, I hope you're well. I hope you had a happy Halloween. Um, so like I said earlier in my email, we have a very full meeting tonight, but a very diverse meeting. So it's going to be a lot of fun. Okay. So first of all, we're going to have our usual Ottawa skies for November. Um, then we'll have a 10-minute astronomy news update, uh, followed by Tim, Gordon, Carmen with uh, some news on the annual general meeting. And then Paul Kloniger with the second part of his Imager's Corner. After the break, we have Danel Polyakov, who is giving a talk on the MAVEN mission, and then Jim Thompson with his travel journal. After that, the usual observations, announcements, door prizes. Okay, three new members this month. Uh, Christopher Barkley, Ernest Paling, and Sheila Reed. Give them a warm welcome. Okay, next. Okay, so we're right up with Dave. Okay, so uh, thanks Kelly. We'll, uh, we'll continue to move on. Somebody's gonna have to advance the, uh, the slides for me tonight. So let's go to the first up. Oh, we're already there. Okay, so full moon is uh, tomorrow night, or tomorrow, uh, November the 4th. Next slide, please. Towards meteor shower is tomorrow night. Uh, forecast is 80% uh, probability of showers and clouds, so it'll be good viewing, not. Uh, it, is a, um, it does run between September 7th and December 10th. It just peak, happens to peak tomorrow night. And uh, it, it comes from the uh, constellation Taurus. It's a 15 to 10 meteor per hour uh, show. Next one. The Leonids uh, meteor shower in November 17th and 18th. Hopefully we'll have clearer skies. Best viewing time for this is after midnight. And um, it, it's about 15 meteors uh, per hour for, for that one. We have a comet, uh, 24P Shamos. Magnitude is plus 10. There's a little uh, map here, or a little uh, sky chart here showing where it's uh, going to be traveling. Uh, we've got another one that uh, has just recently been announced that's going to be um, appearing towards the end of December and you actually be able to see it through your binoculars. Uh, it's Heinz something or with some numbers beside it. Anyways, that, that's coming up in uh, December. <laughs> Let's take a look at the planets then. Mercury. Uh, we have the greatest eastern elongation on November the 24th. The, this way the, uh, the sun will have um, set, but you can still see Mercury. So just, just after sunset, you might be able to see Mercury on, the, um, on that date, the 24th. Venus and Mars. Uh, Venus is visible in the early morning. Mars also visible in the early morning. Jupiter is visible last half of the month in the early morning. Saturn is visible all month in the early evening. Uranus and Neptune are both visible all month. Moving on here, the International Space Station best viewing date is November the 30th. And uh, if we flip to the next uh, slide, you'll see where it goes across the, uh, the, the, the sky, the pattern for that. The, this, this particular uh, map here is from heavensabove.com. It's a great site if you want to uh, take a look at, at where various things pass overhead and uh, it will plot the map uh, for you. And we'll go to our last slide, which is the uh, cartoon for the month. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Dave. And up next is Al Scott. Greetings, everybody. So, tonight's uh, news item is one that we just narrowly missed last month by about three days. There was a big announcement that they had we were announcing the Friday evening of our meeting, but it was happening on the Monday, so I wasn't able to report on it. Uh, so hopefully we can get a slide. Or is our uh, video dead? Anyone? Anyone? There are, I don't see anything, is it? <laughs> I don't think it's my eyes. <laughs> Oh, 
Oh, there we go. Thank you. Okay, I'll, hopefully it wasn't me. So, uh, if Tim is here, he can uh, narrate this one. Thank you, Tim. <laughs> so, on August 17th, um, there was a discovery on the uh, LIGO uh, gravitational interferometers. Again, uh, this has been in the news recently for the discovery of colliding black holes. Nobel Prizes were, uh, were given, and now this. Uh, so the signal in the middle is uh, data from uh, a LIGO uh, interferometer. And these things basically have kilometer-long paths of laser beams interfering, and they can measure the distortion of space-time from gravitational waves passing the Earth from massive bodies moving very quickly. These were predicted by Einstein uh, over 100 years, roughly 100 years ago. And this particular thing was measured on August 17th. And the graph here shows frequency in hertz of what must be two heavy objects going around each other versus time in seconds. And this is uh, some zero point. And then this signal is very bright and it was measured for about 90 seconds. You can see the frequency ramping up from about 10 hertz all the way up to 300, 500, up to 1,000 hertz before it, it, uh, the signal disappeared. And almost coincident with the signal, two seconds later, uh, the Fermi and Integral satellites both detected a gamma ray burst. And you can see those on the top and bottom frames. So this was a unique event never before seen where astronomers have detected both a gravitational signature of two massive bodies spiraling around each other and colliding, as well as the electromagnetic irradiation from a huge explosion somewhere in the universe. Now, astronomers have detected these before. These are called fast gamma ray bursts, and they've not really known what they were. They've theorized that this was uh, caused by a pair of neutron stars colliding and exploding. Uh, so this particular uh, measurement actually confirms uh, that prediction. So what did astronomers do with this? So there are two LIGO uh, gravitational wave observatories in the U.S. that are active and they were able to use the time delay to narrow down where this came from in the universe to a long narrow slice. The Fermi and Integral satellites are able, or the Fermi satellite was able to locate it in a, in, a, in a circular region of the sky, and the overlap of these two things was able to narrow down where this may have happened. Just two weeks before this, the Virgo uh, Gravitational uh, Observatory in Italy had just come online, and they didn't detect anything. And astronomers were puzzled because this was a very bright signal. Why didn't the Virgo system detect this? Well, each of these interferometers have blind spots based on the orientation of the two arms. And so what they did was they assumed that this must have happened in one of the, bright, the blind spots in the Virgo detector, and that actually better uh, localized the signal than if they had potentially detected it. The non-detection localized where it must have happened. And so what happened was they, they basically realized that it had to happen in this area of the sky. They sent out uh, bulletins. And everyone with a telescope went and looked there and searched through the Virgo cluster of galaxies until uh, it was discovered a kilonova was seen in visible radiation. Uh, kilonovas are, are relatively rare. They're not as big as supernovas, only, you know, kilonovas. They're, they're maybe a thousand times as bright as a nova. So this galaxy, NGC 4993, had a new dot on it in the region of uh, where we thought this was. So what they did was they were able to take their big telescopes, look at this thing, measure spectra of the light coming off of this explosion, uh, and measure the red shift of the light, uh, measuring the red shift of the galaxy. This galaxy is roughly 130 million light years away. So what this means is that these signals, the gravitational waves and the gamma rays, have been traveling through space for 130 million years and arrived within two seconds of each other on the Earth and were detected. And what this does is it tells us, confirms that gravitational waves travel at the same speed as, as light, gamma rays, electromagnetic radiation. 
to about three parts in 10 to the 15th. So this is a stunning uh, verification of Einstein's theory of how gravitational waves travel through the universe. Uh, and it's the first time that we've detected both of them from the same event, or from what is expected to be the same event. So the gravitational wave signature was predicted many years in advance, uh, and it very closely followed what people expected from two neutron stars, and they were able to estimate the mass of these neutron stars from the signal and the distance from the gravitational signal intensity, and verify the Hubble expansion, the Hubble coefficient uh, of the universe is based on the redshift, and now we have an independent measurement using gravitational wave intensity as to how far away this is, and measured the Hubble constant about 70, uh, um, which I think it's, was it mega, kilometers per second per megaparsec. Yeah, the units are difficult. Uh, Another interesting thing about this explosion was that the, kill, the, um, the gamma ray burst wasn't very bright. This is only 130 million light years away, which is very close for most what we would consider gamma ray, uh, short gamma ray bursts we've seen have been billions of light years away. In fact, there was one optical counterpart that was potentially discovered uh, back in 2013 to a gamma ray burst without the gravitational wave signature, but that was 4 billion light years away. So this is very close. So astronomers expected them, the signal should have been a lot brighter than it was, and they're not sure why it isn't. And the, the one thing that they think is that as neutron stars are spiraling around each other and they collide, the explosion is funneled in a jet, in a pair of jets, basically, along the axis of their uh, mutual rotation and blocked by the bodies of the neutron stars themselves. So it's very possible that we weren't in the beam of this particular one, or the beams were inclined in a direction that we just got a glancing blow, as it were. So what else do we know about this? So astronomers turned their telescopes to this and watched it, watch its brightness decay. And these kilonovas decay very quickly. What astronomers believe is happening is that uh, basically you're seeing much of this glow is radioactive emissions from heavy elements that were formed in the collision of these, these neutron stars. One was about 0.8 solar masses, the other was two solar masses. And these are basically just big nuclei in space. Huge nuclei, twice the mass of the sun, uh, which collide and then form all of these heavy rare earth elements. This was a theorized thing. Uh, astronomers weren't sure where all the heavy elements beyond iron come from. Supernovas make a, f make a certain amount, but they didn't seem to make enough. So they've now verified that these explosions make maybe 50% or more of all the heavy elements beyond iron in the universe. Uh, and they were able to measure the, the spectrum of the light. And they can see the, the predicted decay of the intensity of the radiation of these various heavy elements, gold, platinum, uh, uranium, plutonium. And they figure in this one explosion around between 10 and 100 Earth masses of gold was created, for example. So if you could actually go there you, and collect some of that, you'd be doing well. <laughs> but you wouldn't be back in time to use it. So that's an, an intriguing discovery. So there's only 16 binary neutron stars known in our galaxy. And based on these discoveries and the, the, the estimated frequency of these things, they only happen like once every 10,000 to 100,000 years in a galaxy, one of these explosions. Yet they're responsible for half of these rare earth elements. Uh, so that's a really, a really neat discovery um, and a really neat verification because, you know, a lot of this stuff you wonder about how accurate are our models? How can we predict these extremely energetic, very rare events with any type of certainty? And the fact that all of this data is coming back and it's very well in line with models is, is really quite surprising it, and, and gratifying <laughs> that we know that science actually works to this degree. So gravitational waves were detected. Uh, no neutrino flux was detected from the neutrino observatories. Uh, of course, neutrinos do have, are theorized to have a slight amount of mass, so presumably that would be delayed somewhat. I'm not sure exactly how long it should be delayed based on the best theories, uh, but it, maybe it wasn't uh, strong enough to be detected at that distance. 
So this is also one of the most observed events in astronomy. Uh, and the papers that came out on this event, uh, there were over 4,500 authors on them. Roughly half of all active astronomers had some influence on this uh, massive event because everyone was turning their telescopes towards this as soon as the bulletins came out to try to find it. Uh, and this chart kind of summarizes the observations and all of the different wave bands from all of the different uh, uh, observatories. So here we have the, the LIGO and Virgo observations, the gamma ray observations, the spectral observations in different wavelengths. And what this part here shows is basically time going from left to right and wavelength going from short to long, uh, showing the, the gravitational waves, actually I guess gravitational waves would be pretty long, um, but in the electromagnetic spectrum areas, the gamma ray burst was just detected here. I think the vertical bars are actual attempted observations, just people looked to see if there was anything else there. Uh, so then there was a delay and it was detected in the optical, and you can see all of these different telescopes. I think there were 70 telescopes looking at it at once that all reported observations around the world. And you can see the, the visible was seen. The UV was, was then imaged. Uh, the infrared was imaged. And you can see it's cooling from bluer to redder. The, the infrared uh, lasted longer than the ultraviolet as this debris cools. And the heavy elements obviously cool more efficiently than uh, other things. So it would be expected to cool off quickly and redden quickly. This is one of the predictions of a neutron star collision. Uh, X-rays were not detected until about uh, nine days later. You can see X-rays were finally detected nine days after the explosion. And what astronomers think might be happening is that the jets are hitting a shell of material left behind or, or, or maybe some sort of a dust cloud uh, in interstellar space. And similarly, radio was also delayed uh, to, to the, when this shock wave hit the surrounding medium. Uh, so the, the, the material itself wasn't glowing in X-ray or radio that we could detect. But these things will also be around the longest, the, the radio especially will be around the longest. And people haven't yet decided whether this formed a black hole or maybe some sort of anomalous, anomalous neutron star left over. Uh, so further observations will be needed to see what might be left there. Uh, when this thing, uh, right now it's, it's close to the sun and it's going to be coming away from the sun, should be able to, uh, to view it a little bit more. So a very interesting discovery uh, in all sorts of bands and very gratifying to see uh, how well the data conformed to the predictions and the amount of, of independent verifications of various theories that have been generated by this you almost think that the Nobel Prizes were awarded too soon because this one is even better than the black hole one. So I, I'm, I'm waiting to see what happens next year in physics. It's a, it's a very big discovery. And, and who would they give the, black, uh, the prize to? All 4,500 astronomers, maybe? Anyways, uh, very interesting. So thank you for your attention. Okay, so I'll invite Tim Gordon and Carmen to approach the stage. Tim, you're up first. Thank you. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Oh, right, sorry. Anyway, um, our annual general meeting takes place at our next regular meeting, and if you think I can remember the date of our next meeting, I'm not certain. Uh, however, I am reminded by looking back over my shoulder that uh, I have something else to mention. Um, Chris, Taryn, and I were uh, representing the Ottawa Center at the uh, Aviation Museum's, um, I don't know, get together for affiliates, I believe is the best way to phrase it. And um, they like us, they really like us. Sorry, it's my Sally Field moment. But um, we received this lovely little plaque in uh, appreciation for the uh, contributions we've been making. Um, very pleasant little, uh, little uh, schmooze fest on uh, Wednesday. Um, anyway, it's nice to know that we have people who um, are hosting us and are happy to have us here. So uh, this could be the start of a beautiful friendship. Yeah, never mind.
Okay, yes, December 3rd, annual general meeting. Um, now, we are required legally to have an annual general meeting in which we will discuss the finances of the club, um, discuss the actions of the, uh, you know, what we've been up to for the last year and, and whatever uh, we're planning on for upcoming years, and also uh, the opportunity to elect um, your councillors and uh, your executive members. Um, I will leave Gordon to cover that one. Uh, you should have received uh, an email notice of this, uh, and, and as well, we have also published this in after notes, as is the requirement. Um, Would it not be the first? Um, I'm only reading the slide. I don't know these things. Uh, all right, then I guess it's the first. I don't know. I don't have a calendar. Um, our first meeting in December. Thank you. Okay, Let's, this was just a test to make sure that you were awake. Now, I'm glad to see that you've detected this and thereby verified that, oh, never mind, shut up, Tim. Um, anyway, seriously speaking, um, I know the AGM is usually considered to be something that's a little on the dull side, and I, I suppose it is in a way, but it actually is an important aspect because it's the uh, opportunity for us to be accountable for the people who are running this club on your behalf to be accountable to you. And... Uh, you know, that's, that's something you have to take seriously, and I'm, I'm only starting to take it more seriously now, I guess, than, than when I was sitting out there thinking, oh, no, not the AGM. Um, so, I mean, we'll try to keep it from being painful, but, you know, do take it as your opportunity to, to see what's going on on your behalf and to see what, what the future of the, uh, of the club is and uh, an opportunity to, to hold people accountable and the opportunity for you to take part in running this club. Uh, I will leave that part to Gordon, who is operating as our past president and also the chairman of the nomination committee. Thank you, Tim. Uh, I'm not sure how I got elected past president, but you were <laughs> evolved into oh, I, past I, president. Evolved or devolved? I'm not going there with a disinfecting okay, okay. barge. <laughs> so I'm in charge of the nominating committee. And so far, everybody <clears throat> has agreed to stand for the positions they currently hold, um, with the exception of Karen, who stepped, no, that's an appointed position, isn't it? No, no, national representative is. Yeah, Brian, yeah so that's right. Brian McCullough has stepped down as a national representative, and Karen Finstad has agreed to stand for that position. If anybody else is interested, they can run for those positions as well. Um, in addition to that, we need an astronauts editor uh, come. January, there won't be an astronauts if somebody doesn't come forward. Uh, Janet has been working as the assistant editor, and I'm hoping that she'll agree to help anybody who wants to step forward. And she's nodding yes, so that's good. Uh, currently, uh, Taras is acting as our emergency go-to person to deal with web issues, but is not really the webmaster. We do need a webmaster. So if anybody has some experience in that field, please step forward. I should point out, though, that Terrace has been incredibly, incredibly helpful in, mm -hmm. in keeping the web running. And he's been acting as an excellent uh, technical resource. Yeah. He's just, I think he sold his soul to the devil for arcane <laughs> IT knowledge myself. But, uh, and again, I'm sure he'd be there to back up anybody who wanted to take this on. I won't want to speak for anybody who can do that kind of I IT magic. You're saying you're not at the mic, but Carmen's going to cover all this in, on the next slide. Ah, okay. 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 Um, there are two other positions we need to fill. One is public outreach to oversee all, all our public outreach events. And the other one is light pollution. Someone to try and help us reduce light pollution. That's basically it. Now, I guess the one thing I did want to point out, though, is anybody who decides to take on any of these positions, it's not as if you're going to be dumped into it with, bye, take care of it all. Um, you can appoint anybody that you wish to help out. Um, there are people who've done this before, 
uh, who, if even if they're not into doing it as a full-time basis anymore, well, not a full-time, but as a regular official thing, are still willing to help out and provide some expertise. So, you know, don't, uh, don't necessarily fear that, oh, gee, I'm, I'm not up to that. I'm, and if, if you take something on and decide, man, this, this is just not what I want to do, well, you know, nobody's going to put a gun to your head and say, keep doing it. Well, not often anyway. But um, <laughs> seriously speaking, I mean, if you find, you, if you find you've taken something on and you, it's just not for you, say so. Yeah. It, it's, you know, it, this, is a, this is a volunteer club. And, um, you know, I, I'd encourage you to take a shot at it uh, if, if, if you're thinking about it. Um, you're not going to be just hung out to dry, and if you decide that you really hate it, um, you know, you, you can walk away without any shame. Yeah, two so. years later. <laughs> <laughs> Seriously speaking, though, I mean, if, if you decide that you can't handle a post, to handle a, an appointed position, then all you have to do is just say, that's it, I want out. Yeah. And that's I, it. The, the other thing there is that um, the team that we have on council right now is, is really good, and they're really getting a lot of things done, and there's a lot of support there. So, you've got all of council as backup as well. Carmen? Okay, so I'm going to speak to you now about what those uh, open positions entail rather than just saying, you know, here are their titles and sign up for it. You don't know what you're getting into. So, um, uh, first of all, astronauts editor. Uh, next slide. I hope. Chris, do you have another slide that uh, details? No? Oh, okay. I'm going to have to... Um, Good thing you brought your notes. Yeah. I'm going to have to get my notes now. And because they're written in that print, I'm of the age where I have to get my glasses out, unfortunately. My arms are no longer long enough. Yep. I always wonder why my father did that. How pretentious. Yeah. <laughs> now I'm doing it too. Long arm sight. Okay. So, astronauts editor. Um, so we have 10 electronic I issues of, of astronauts annually, so you would be in charge of um, uh, engineering that. Uh, you need to solicit articles and content from members um, by friendly persuasion, or often you will also have people who come forward. Typically, if someone's given a talk and they want to give a little more information about what they had researched, possibly, uh, that's a common um, um, topic in astronauts as well. Um, keep eyes and ears open for astronomy events locally and nationally to promote them. And uh, consider long-term migration of astronauts into the website. There, there's been on and off a lot of discussion over the last little while about uh, whether we should do this or not, whether we should have um, something that's electronic and separate from our website, um, such as astronauts, or should astronauts just be sort of incorporated into the website because that's the go-to place for people typically anyway. Um, there is there is enough of a body of people who seem to feel that astronauts is special and important because it does highlight the, the key things for the month uh, that maybe is a little bit harder to get through uh, from the website. So we really do need someone and um, uh, there's lots of expertise out here in our club as well if you need some help. Uh, so next one is Webmaster. So, um, not to take away from uh, Taras's uh, excellent work, but he could use some help. Um, the, your job would be to manage the, set, the center's website with, not necessarily all by yourself, of course, but with hopefully uh, what would, would be optimistically um, um, possible, we would hope, is to have a team of people who would uh, kind of trade each other off. Uh, delegate some of the work to, as, as I said, assistant uh, webmasters. Keep information on center events and contact people and everything else updated on the website. Uh, solicit content from members. Assist in posting astronauts and meeting videos, etc. And uh, the work, by the way, is in a program called Drupal. Um, if you're not familiar with that, but you do have uh, con computer science uh, savvy, um, you wouldn't find it that difficult. And there is uh, training from, um, um, from National for that. Uh, public outreach coordinator. Um, coordinate public outreach activities. That doesn't mean to say organize all of them, but be kind of like the cornerstone where you can um, uh, delegate to people, uh, make sure that things are on track for a variety of um, uh, activities, take on some yourself. 
uh, delegate and coordinate then with um, people who are already doing that sort of thing. For example, like the star parties, we already have someone who uh, uh, organizes that, so it's not that you're going to have to do that too. Um, there are other things like museum uh, outreach events and special, um, special events, like for example, the one we had on Parliament Hill. Uh, respond to requests for outreach as well from the general public. Light pollution abatement coordinator. Monitor policies at municipal governments and advocate for light pollution uh, reduction. This typically happens when, say, a new development is going up or a big shopping mall or something else in the city of Ottawa where uh, it's important for us to kind of re-educate the city and also the builders that uh, it is important. Uh, light pollution is a big issue and uh, uh, it also saves money if you uh, use uh, better lighting, uh, more efficient lighting and intervene on um, uh, other large products, uh, pro projects, as I said, um, uh, not necessarily city-based, but also um, from the private sector. So um, I hope I haven't uh, scared anybody off. Um, they're, they're not, as, as we've all been saying, it's not a job necessarily for one person to take on all of that activity. It's more that we need people who are like the leaders of the project, just like in, in any other, you know, private or public sector, there's, there's somebody who kind of manages the whole thing and uh, is able to get some people on board to do small activities. Maybe they take on the same as well. But uh, human nature being what it is, we really need somebody in each of those um, positions to take on the, the coordination of it. So if uh, any of you are interested, um, please see me or Tim Cole or Gordon or uh, maybe Mike Mogadam, our vice president and um, hopefully um, we'll be able to have those uh, positions filled. Thanks. Thank you, Jeremy. So as for the Paul Comisian Observer of the Year Award, um, this is going to be awarded to an outstanding observer um, for their work during the year of 2017. Um, so if you would like to submit uh, some observations, some reports, some pictures, you can send them to me at my email address. Um, however, the images you have submitted into observation reports during the meetings are taken into consideration. So if you've submitted some pictures and presented them at the meetings, um, you are in the running to win this prize. However, if you would like to send me some more uh, observations, uh, I would need you to do it before Sunday, November 19th. So next up, uh, for the second installment of Imager's Corner, I believe, Paul Klanger. <clears throat> I have my handy little spider here, so there we go. In case I forget what I was gonna talk about. So good evening, everybody. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, I, I wanted to uh, follow up on uh, the first segment of the uh, Imager's Corner, which, uh, which I presented back in June. Uh, so uh, sorry for the uh, lengthy delay between segments there, but that gives you a lot of, uh, hopefully that gave you enough time to, uh, for those interested uh, to uh, get out and do some shooting, to play with your cameras, and. Uh, and uh, to, to learn what they're capable of. We did have some half-decent weather. We certainly have had some, uh, some good observation opportunities in, in September and October before, uh, before uh, fall rolled in. So uh, hopefully, uh, hopefully some of you are eager to, to pass on to the next step, which is, uh, which is basic processing. So what you've seen, if, for those of you that have tried this, and for the, uh, let, me, let me step back a moment. For those that haven't tried this uh, and, and aren't familiar with this segment that I'm talking about, back in June I, I talked about um, uh, getting into basic astro imaging. This is something that's come up uh, very frequently at, uh, at, our, at our meetings and, and in other venues there. And, uh, and so we, we founded the images, Imagers Corner to, uh, to address some of those, uh, 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 those uh, requests. And so what I decided to do with the first segment is just to get people out of never done astrophotography before and, but are interested in it to, uh, to give it a go, to give it a try there. And uh, so what I did is I, I made some very basic uh, suggestions. Uh, see if I can get this thing, thingy to work. And uh, I'll just recap that. I won't take long to do that, but I'll just recap what I did in the, in the first segment back in June. 
to get you going with, uh, with your uh, early pursuits in, in astro imaging. Uh, of course, if you want to see the full segment, that's available on, on the videos that, uh, that we've got posted for, for the regular meetings there. And so you can, uh, you can check that out if you're interested. Also, if you want the uh, copies, a PDF copy of the slides that, uh, that were presented, uh, uh, just email me and I'll send you a PDF copy. So I'm just going to do a really quick summary on this. Uh, basically, what we, uh, I'm going on the assumption that, you know, you've got a camera. Uh, we recommend uh, obviously uh, DSLRs or uh, mirrorless cameras. They're uh, they're the most suitable for for getting into this uh, pursuit uh, at a, at an initial level. And uh, so, going on the assumption that you have a DSLR, uh, you also need tripod, nice sturdy tripod, not a flimsy one, uh, because you want to keep everything nice and steady. Uh, you want an intervalometer, a way to trigger your camera. You can also do this with a computer if you're used to linking your computer to, uh, to your camera, but uh, this keeps it simple in the field, an intervalometer. You can buy these uh, third-party devices for uh, $40 or so uh, on the web. And uh, what they allow you to do is, with a little controller there, program a sequence of shots uh, up, up to about uh, 999, I believe, for some of them. Um, you can, uh, you can uh, set the duration of the exposure, and this is, this is really for, for exposures in excess of 30 seconds because uh, most DSLRs are, have set exposure times that you can dial in up to a maximum of 30 seconds. If you want to go beyond that, you have to go to bulb setting, and uh, this allows you to do that. And so you can set any time you want, you can set a delay between them. Very handy device, especially if you're interested in doing any kind of time-lapse imaging because the last thing you want to do there is three hours spending on clicking every 30 seconds, you'll go, oops, you'll go crazy or deaf. Um, so yeah, very handy device. Uh, the other thing you'll need, especially in our climate and especially if you've done any shooting in the last, in the last month or so, is a dew heater for your lens. I recommended uh, wide angle lenses to start with because they're no brainers. Basically, you don't need any tracking, no guiding. You just set it up on your tripod, you aim at the part of the sky that you want, and uh, Bob's your uncle, you go with it, right? But especially in the fall and the spring, uh, the air tends to be very humid, the temperature drops uh, re relatively rapidly at night, and so dew is a real problem, especially for wide-angle lenses that uh, have little or no uh, dew shields or sun shields up in front of them. There. You've got a lot of glass exposed, and it will do up very quickly. So a dew heater uh, strap, these aren't, aren't horribly expensive. It wraps around the lens, it's, oops. There we go. Laser, where are you? There you are. Ah. These buttons are not made for my fingers. Oh no, no, what have I done now? <laughs> I've detonated it, no, there we go. Okay, let's try this again with feeling. I'll try to keep my finger off the other buttons. Uh, yes, yeah, so, okay, I think I'm gonna forego the, uh, the laser pointer. You can see what's happening here. Uh, you've got the dew strap wrapped around the front of the lens. It's powered by a 12 volt power supply in the field. You can pick these up at Canadian Tire for a reasonable price. And in between them is a dew heater controller. The, the, the dew strap plugs into that and the dew heater controller plugs into the power supply to, uh, to drive the whole thing. It just applies, a, applies a, a very small current, a very small amount of heating to the, to the, uh, to the lens hood around the lens and it keeps the dew at bay for hours. And if you don't use one of these, uh, you're, gonna be, uh, you're going to be very disappointed because your lens will get very wet very fast at this time of year. Okay, so that's the equipment setup, really very basic. And what I suggested in the, in the first installment is um, to learn your camera. Uh, I've, I've taught astrophotography uh, uh, for a few years now um, at the School of Photographic Arts and uh, when I do the field session that's associated with that course, I always get people coming out to the, to the field session and they don't know the, the more intricate settings of their camera. I mean, they're used to using their camera in, in daylight uh, settings most of the time 
And uh, the last thing you want to do is try to learn your camera at night when it's dark. And you've got a limited amount of, of, uh, of night to play with. So uh, learn your camera. That's the first big thing. Learn, learn how to set your exposure lengths. Learn what the difference is between uh, the manual or the B settings uh, if you have them on your camera. Also learn about your lens, how to set the, the apertures manually and setting the ISO level. Because What's critical with this is that most auto settings that are programmed into your camera are useless for astrophotography. They're just not made for that. So you're on your own. Forget about autofocus. That really doesn't work unless you're shooting something really bright like the moon. Um, you're, you're on your own and you have to know how to, to adjust these things manually. So the best thing to do is to practice at home before coming out into the field uh, so that once you do get out in the field, you can set up and you can start to do your thing. Um, you want to try this on a preferably moonless clear night. Uh, uh, we have a really nice clear night on the go tonight, but a very full and bright moon. Um, still, you could use a night like that for doing uh, you know, tests and experiments and things like that. But uh, moonless nights are better because they obviously allow you to, uh, the sky to become much darker, and uh, if you're, especially if you're away from the city. And uh, so you can, you can, you can, your images can go a lot deeper. Than, uh, than when you've got a full moon up there because it'll, it'll wash out any fainter objects. So pick a convenient site. I suggested uh, that you might want to try this in your backyard, even if you live in the city. I mean, you're, you're going to get various different results from the city to a rural site or to a dark sky site, but it's all part of the learning experience. So um, backyards are probably a good first place to go. <clears throat> you don't have to travel very far and you can just, uh, you know, if you get cold and stuff like that, it's, again, it's a learning experience. You need to, especially in our environment with winter coming and stuff, you need to know uh, how, to, how to dress for that because it's not, a, it's not a very physically active pursuit unless you're doing jumping jacks out there. Um, so it's easy to get chilled pretty quickly. You've got to learn how to dress right and be relatively stationary for a while. And in the summer, uh, you've got to learn how to deal with bugs. So anyway, yeah. Do your backyard first, and then if you've got the convenience of, of heading out to a darker sky site like, uh, like FLO, uh, then, then take advantage of that. So to do your, what I suggested uh, back in that first session is to, uh, once, you, once you get out onto the site, is to set up your equipment, uh, find an aim at Polaris, um, and then the suggested camera settings. Again, you can, if you're interested in this stuff, I won't read all that. Um, I'll, I can send you the notes or you can view the uh, video from the June meeting. Um, set your camera to appropriate values and then focus your image. Focusing is, is where the majority of, uh, of astro images fail because focusing, uh, even though it's a lot easier now with digital cameras, is still is still a bugaboo. Most people are, are used to using autofocus with their DSLRs. As I said, that's useless. You've got to learn how to do it um, manually. And so there's, uh, you can use your live view to an extent by shining, you know, aiming at a bright star and then, uh, and then honing the image, focusing it so you get a nice tight bright star uh, and then aim at your, your sky area of interest. But you've got to take the time to focus your image because otherwise even a little bit of, um, of defocusing will give you bloated stars and or even worse, donut stars. So. All right. The other thing I suggested was to just to keep a track of the settings that you use. You're, you're doing science here. You're doing an experiment. You're, you're learning uh, what you're doing. And so keeping a log of, as to what you're doing will allow you to go back later on and analyze what you've done, what worked for you, and what didn't work for you. Otherwise, you wind up repeating the same things because you, you wind up thinking to yourself, well, what was it that I did like three weeks ago? So yeah, anyway, uh, uh, keeping a log is very useful. And then what I suggested is once you've got all that stuff together, it's just a shoot a variety of exposures. Learn your camera. Try different exposures from five seconds up to five minutes if, you're, if your site supports it. Uh, in town, of course, you'll be limited to a lot less than that because your, your sky brightness will saturate along with four or five minutes. So different exposure times, different ISO settings, different settings on your lens. It's all stuff you have to experiment with. It's all stuff you want to learn before you take, go to the next step and, and do, uh, do uh, more sophisticated imaging. I also suggested shooting dark frames. Uh, we won't worry about that right now. That's, for, uh, that's a discussion for a later date. So what I suggested was Polaris. Polaris is easy to find even in the city. Uh, on a clear night, you can, uh, 
you can usually find Polaris. And what I suggest is just to do a series of shots on Polaris. Polaris doesn't move through the course of the night, especially if you're using a, a, a wide-angle lens. It, it's, it's the only thing that'll be stationary in the sky for as long as you're out there. And by shooting a sequence of images of varying lengths, you'll start to see star trails around Polaris. That'll give you a sense for what, this, what the Earth's rotation does to your star images. Right? You're not tracking any of this. You're not guiding any of this. It's just stationary camera on a tripod. And the star trails will show you, as you can see at the peripheries, the farther away you get from Polaris, the, uh, the more pronounced the star trails are due to the Earth's rotation. So it's a good starting point. So where do we go from here? That, that's basically what I suggested in, in our first segment. Where do we go from here? Well, oops. If you, if you want to do some wide field astrophotography, not only is the, is, the, is the portion of the sky that you want to uh, shoot of, of interest, obviously, and you, you want to figure out what you want to do there, uh, but you're also looking at the foreground. I mean, this is true in all photography, day or night. I mean, you, you're considering all the elements, but especially for uh, 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 astrophotography and especially for time-lapse sequences, uh, you've got to give careful thought to the foreground because you want to make it interesting. You want to, you, you know, interesting to you and, and perhaps to others as well. It's, it's an artistic interpretation, um, but it's a, a major factor that you've got to consider. So just a couple of, uh, just a couple of shots that I, I've done using the same setup, just camera on tripod. These are just camera on tripod shots, and uh, uh, that, that one is one I'll use for, for the talk tonight. That's one I just shot up at uh, Lake Superior last year, Lake Superior Provincial Park with the uh, Milky Way setting over Lake Superior. Okay, this one, this one, the, for the technical specs on this image, this was shot with a 16 millimeter lens, so very wide angle, uh, 30 second exposure, and ISO 3200. So you might want to, you might wonder, well, why 30 seconds? Why did, it, why did I choose these parameters? What I wanted to do was try to minimize the star trailing, so I didn't want the exposures to go too long and I wanted to maximize the amount of detail that I could capture in, in whatever time interval I chose. So I experimented with a few things depending on the sky conditions up there because they were very dark, even darker than I, where, where I live. And uh, so I wanted to try to optimize it. And uh, as a result, 30 seconds seemed to be the optimum. ISO 3200, it's running pretty hot, but again, it allow, allows me to, to get good penetration on, on the objects. You can see a lot of detail along the Milky Way there. And uh, even though it's a fairly high uh, ISO setting, uh, it is, uh, with, with appropriate processing, it's easy to, uh, it's relatively easy to reduce the noise that's inherent in such high ISO exposures. So, let's see where we are here. Oh, yes. Anyway, so I'll, I'll use this and uh, we'll take it from there. Let me just uh, check my note here. So where do we go? You've, you've, you've gone on a vacation, you've gone into uh, you know, a, a nice site uh, out in the country there, you found a nice piece of real estate to, to, to frame your sky shot and you're clicking away. You come home and you've got a whole bunch of nice images to work with. Where do we go from here? Well, that's the topic for tonight's uh, segment and that's basic image processing. Remember, I'm going on the assumption here that people that are interested in doing this haven't done any astro astrophotography uh, before, and uh, so I'm, I'm making no assumptions, and I'm going to try to keep it uh, very basic, uh, rather than uh, get you to, to go out and buy uh, Photoshop and uh, spend the next six months trying to learn it. So. First thing you want to do when you get home, process your image. And, and, and let, let me back up just a half a step here. For those of you that haven't done this before, you, 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 you'll see that you know, there's, a lot, you know, there's a fair bit involved. And, and talk to anybody that does astrophotography, they'll tell you that the processing part of it is uh, lengthier and more time consuming than the actual acquisition of images. You'll spend more time processing and playing around with settings than you will actually shooting the images. So processing is a critical part of, uh, of, of getting a good astro image. First thing you want to do is to calibrate your monitor. Calibrate your monitor because if you've seen, 
you know, it, it, when, when you go to a place like Best Buy even, uh, and you see, look at digital TVs, they're essentially the same as, as monitors there. And you look, they're all showing the same program, but they all look different. They all, you know, some are brighter, some are crisper, some are more contrasty. There's a whole range of settings that, that can be set on these devices that give you the view that you're gonna, your brain is going to interpret to try to process what, what you've shot. And if you don't do some measure of calibration, it might look fine on your monitor. You know, once you've, once you've started playing with the software, it might look great on your monitor, but you send this email of that off to a friend or, or you, you send it into, into, into the club here for, for display one, uh, on, on, at one of our meetings, and it looks god-awful. You've, you've heard a number of us who are, who've been into this for a while whine about, oh, the projector, it's too hot, or the colors are washed out, or blah, blah, blah. I mean, we've seen that, right? And you, there's some things you can control and some things you can't. But this you can control because this is where you're creating your image. So if you calibrate your monitor one way or another, at least you're trying to create an image to a standard configuration and something that will work for most people and most, most other displays. There are very sophisticated ways of doing this, as with the device that you see on the right called a spider. This is actually something that works with software. You place it on your monitor, and it'll the software will instruct you to go through a number of different settings to, you know, to brighten red, dim the blue, uh, do the brightness, all sorts of things that you can adjust either on your monitor or the software that drives your graphics card in your computer. And as a result, once you finish that calibration, it's not something you have to do all the time. Typically, you know, we, we, we tend to do this, for those of us that are into doing a lot of this, we, we tend to calibrate our screens, you know, every, you know, a couple times a year, maybe, maybe three, four times a year, um, just, to keep, just to keep that uniform, consistent standard. Now, they're pricey devices, so for, for people just getting into that, they, they might be a little bit hard there. I think they're running about $250, $300. Um, but they'll last you forever. If you don't, if you don't want to go that far initially, what you can do, um, obviously not as accurate, but uh, you can go up in the web or use the chart that I've got in the presentation here and use a, a, a calibration screen, as, as you see at the bottom left here. That allows you to calibrate things like, especially the brightness of the monitor and, and, the, uh, and the things like the contrast and the gamma because, okay, I'm going to try this pointer again. Man, these are small buttons. Let me try this again. Okay, there we go. So you can see at the top, at the top is a gray scale. So this represents saturation, in other words, pure white. And as you go to this end of it, it's pure black. If you throw this file on your screen and you're seeing everything that's black or everything from here down to there as black, you can't differentiate the different bars or everything from here on that's, you know, it's all white, you can't differentiate the different levels, then you know your monitor's out of whack. It's, it's, it needs to be calibrated. You're, you know, maybe you've set it that way because where you tend to work with your computer is very harsh light, so you crank up the brightness. There's all sorts of reasons, but using a chart like this at least puts you in the ballpark of calibrating your image so that you can work, at least on your own stuff, in a consistent and standard manner. Same thing with the color bars down below. All the, all the color of, of, of the images that you see, uh, they're all combinations of red, green, and blue colors. That's what they are, just uh, uh, millions of combinations of red, green, and blue. So the, the basic primaries there are what you want to look at. And again, if your monitor is too bright or too contrasty, the gamma's off, the color temperature is off, then the colors will look weird. And you may get, again, you may get too many blacks on one end where you can't differentiate the levels or too many bright levels where, where you can't differentiate between them. So you want to try to balance that. You want to try to set your, your, your monitor so that it's at least you can see the whole gamut from saturation to, 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 to pure darkness. So calibration is a good thing. So the next thing is... Raw format. I suggested raw format as well as JPEG for when you shoot. Most cameras will allow you to dial in both. So when you take a shot, your camera will produce a JPEG image and it will produce a raw file. So there's a huge difference in those two formats. The raw file keeps all the data that your sensor can deliver. Okay, so you take a shot, 
it's, it's pretty deep. There's a, there's a lot of data there. The JPEG, and, and, and it's, a, it's a lossless format, so it's, it's true to, to what the sensor receives and little or no in-camera processing is done on that raw file. That's very significant because you want, you want the data. I mean, you went out to the field, you, you froze your buns off, and, uh, and you, you came back with a whole pile of pictures. The last thing you want to do is throw away most of your data by just working in JPEG. Okay, and that's what JPEG is. JPEG is a, it's a good format for, for, for showing a final display of an image, but not to process the image because it's a lossy format, and it also is, uh, it, it's limited to eight bits. Now, there are lossless JPEG formats, I realize, but the most common ones are, are, are what we call lossy formats. Mathematical algorithms are applied in order to reduce the file size, and so, so we cheat a little bit here and we say, you know, oh, these two reds are pretty close. We'll call that as one red and, and there. Now we only have one data point to work with as opposed to two or three or four. Paul, what's the worst thing that happens when you use a JPEG? It's lossy. It's, it's lossy. You, what happens, depending on the degree of compression, you get artifacts. So you get, you get uh, enhancements to your, your chroma noise, for instance, your color noise. Uh, you'll, you'll notice that if a JPEG file is really very compressed to make it very tiny, um, that, that you'll get unusual dark banding around, around areas of high contrast in colors. So there's, there's a number of things that drop out uh, as a result of that compression. The other thing is that JPEG is, only works in eight bits. As you can see on the chart on the, uh, on the, uh, on the right side, what, what that chart tells you is that Remember I said all the, all the color that you see in any image on a computer screen or a TV is just a combination of red, green, and blue. And in a JPEG file, each of those color channels is divided into 256 slivers from total saturation, in other words, totally bright, to totally dark, 256 levels, okay? That's 2 to the power 8. That's not a lot of levels to work with, especially when you consider your DSLR camera sensor and the analog to digital converter that's attached to it uh, will deliver or will, will take those same red, green, and blue channels and it'll chop them up into, if it's a 12-bit uh, analog to digital converter, over 4,000 levels. Most DSLR, most, uh, most high-end DSLRs today are 14 bits, so you're, you're looking at uh, 16,000 levels, as opposed to the 256 that you get in, uh, in, in JPEG. And of course, uh, dedicated astronomical cameras go one step further. They have 16-bit analog to digital converters, so you have 65,000 levels between what is totally black and what is totally saturated in each of those color channels. So you can see it's a huge, huge difference. So for each level in an 8-bit file, if you look down at 16 bits, you get, each level is then subdivided into 256 subsequent levels. So you get much greater tonal range, which allows you to do much more sophisticated processing. It allows you to stretch things and and, uh, and uh, we'll get into all of that stuff at a later date, but it allows you to manipulate that image, especially with the tonal values, to a much higher degree than JPEG. And again, as I said, the raw format is totally lossless. So if, if you don't understand how that works, I mean, on the, right, on the left hand side, uh, there's a very simple, if, uh, right hand, or uh, left hand side down at the bottom, there's a very simple representation that I've put together there of two stars. And in this very cheap camera, uh, only, only uh, you know, totally black is zero and totally, uh, totally saturated is nine. So you have only 10 different levels. And you can see how that image, pixel by pixel, is translated into numbers above. Okay, so very simple example, but that's exactly what happens with, with real sensors. Um, uh, uh, on the other side there, and so very inexpensive cameras and that uh, are work at the 8-bit level, but your DSLR is capable of delivering a lot more data. So you want that raw image because you want to retain that data. That will allow you to do way better processing and, and allow you to do it in different ways as well. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay, so next step is uh, an imaging pro program. 
You need an imaging program to do this stuff. Again, I'm assuming very simple, uh, very, very introductory stuff because this is, a, this is an introductory uh, instructional program. So basically, what we've got there is you, you, can, you can use a lot of different programs. There's a lot of good stuff out in the market. Uh, you know, if you, if you, you may already have some of these, uh, but things like Photoshop and Lightroom, Maxim DL, PixInsight, these are really high level editors uh, that allow you to do very sophisticated image processing, but the, most of them have quite the learning curve associated with them and, the, and quite a price tag associated with them. So uh, for, for this discussion, I'm just going to talk about uh, the stuff that you probably already have in hand. If you bought your DS, when you bought your DSLR, most manufacturers, well, all manufacturers supply access, free access to uh, an image uh, editing program to allow you to bring those raw files in and, and convert them into other formats. Uh, there's also some excellent freeware available that I highly recommend you look at if you if you haven't got access to any of this other stuff. Uh, Irfan View and uh, uh, GIMP, which is uh, GNU. Uh, image manipulation program. Weird title, but GIMP is is almost a Photoshop clone, and it's free. And there's a lot of plugins available for it. So a pretty steep learning curve on that one, but it is free and uh, well worth examining. So just going to breeze through the really simple stuff that that that, that I want to pass on to you today. Uh, I, I'm using Digital Photo Professional, which is the Canon uh, supplied utility to pick an image or to manipulate an image. Uh, again, I'm dealing with raw files. Uh, from a sequence, uh, from a night's worth of shooting, I'll pick a, an image that, that I like the best and uh, then I'll manipulate it. Double click on it, you get a, the, the file opening up by itself in the window and you get a tool palette that, that you can work with. So this tool palette you can see runs, has a number of tabs on the top there. I'm not going to go into all the details there, but essentially there's a raw RGB and a couple of other tabs here. What these allow you to do is to start manipulating your data. The raw tab is just for raw images. If you open up a, a TIFF or a JPEG file in this, uh, you, that tab won't be accessible. Only the RGB tab will be. But you can, uh, you can start your manipulation on, on your image whoop, there by, uh, by moving these little uh, diamonds there on the side there and altering the shape of the curve. I'm not doing this interactively, so I just did a bunch of screenshots. So you can see uh, uh, just from the last shot how the, uh, just sliding the curve over on this side has, has darkened it. Okay? I tend to, I, I, when I use this, I, I do play with, on the raw side with it, but you can also use the RGB side because it, ha it's, uh, it has a wider range of adjustments and also like the way in this program it shows me what the levels of the different color planes are and you can adjust those separately. So if your sky is too, too orangey because you're shot in a city and you've got a, a lot of sodium lights, you can dial some of that out by adjusting the, the red, green, and the blue planes. As you can see there, I'm just adjusting some of the levels there. There's the RGB level, it's kind of taking it down a little bit. Uh, I like bl more blue in my image, so you can see the blue is going from zero to 255 at the moment, but when I drag it down, it pops up the blue right away. This is color balancing. It's, it's, it's adjusting the overall tonal values of, of, your, of your image there to something that's, uh, that you, you as the creator find uh, uh, more interesting. You can also do things like hue and saturation and sharpness adjustments in this. And again, the critical thing to remember here is that when you make these adjustments, you're making them to the raw file, but you're going to save this as something else, and so the raw file, your original data, will remain unaltered. And you can always go back and change it. Um, this particular program also allows you to do things like noise reduction, um, and uh, uh, especially in luminance and, and chrominance, and uh, lighting optimization. There's a, there's a whole raft of tools. And the other programs that come with things like Nikon cameras, I think it's a ViewFXi, uh, will do similar things. Or if you've got Pentax or a Sony, uh, you'll just have to find where these analogous features are in your program. You can also load lens profiles in this, which uh, if, if it, you happen to be shooting with a Canon lens, this is a data supplied by Canon, which will allow you to make adjustments to, you know, to the way the image is captured by the lens. It'll, it'll remove some of the distortions that, uh, that you may run into. Paul, have you ever lost your original raw file? Um, only when I get a computer crash. Alters the original file? 
It it can, but 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 all that stuff is 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 reversible in 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 a in a raw file, which is which is rather nice. But what I tend to do is once I'm once I've got my adjustments done, as you saw with those with those uh, various settings on the tab there, I then I, I do most of my processing in uh, in Photoshop, and so I'd like to work with 16-bit TIFF files. That gives me my 65,000 levels per color plane. And so when I've finished my adjustments here, I don't save it back out to the raw file, I save it to a TIFF file. And that's what I'm gonna take into Photoshop later to do higher, higher level processing. So yeah, you, you, see, you, can, you can choose your choice of formats and save it out and uh, your raw data will be untouched. If you learn new tricks as you go, as we all do as we do this, uh, you can go back at a, at a later date pull out the same raw data and apply the new stuff that you've learned. Okay. For the other, the, the freeware programs I mentioned, Earphone View is one that I recommend that you, you spend a bit of time with. You can download this. Again, the, the, the URL was, uh, was available on, on the slides there and I'll send you them if you're, if you're interested. Um, this is a very simple program, but it's quite powerful. There's a lot of features in it. Um, and the learning curve is not very steep there. So you basically, and, it, and it's capable of reading your raw files. So you can open up a raw file in Earthen View. Uh, you can do color corrections. You can see the image uh, menu drops down and, and color corrections are highlighted. That opens a dialog box, which again allows you to adjust individual red, green, and blue levels, brightness, contrast, gamma, all manner of things to get the image to look the way you want. Because as you see, from the, from the little previews on the, on the left and right. The initial image has a lot of green in it. There's a lot of, probably a lot of sky glow at that point in time. And I like my images to be like a deep blue. So I shift them and, uh, and uh, play with them until I get, start to get the result that I want, which is what you see there. All right. And the last one that I'll mention is GIMP. I won't get into the details. This is the one that's like a Photoshop clone. This is a really cool program. Lots and lots of features. It's open source, so there's a lot of uh, global support for this program. It's been around for about 20 years. And, uh, and uh, again, when you see the under the colors menu, <coughs> you can see that you can adjust color balance, hue, saturation, uh, all manner of things. It's a feature-rich uh, program there. The only drawback with those two programs, with Earphon View and with GIMP, is that they're eight, uh, they work in 8-bit, not 16-bit. So even though they can read your data in 16-bit, uh, their color planes are, are, are hardwired into 8-bit. So any manipulation you do can only produce an 8-bit file as opposed to 16. But because you're starting with, with the good solid data of a raw file, uh, you can, uh, you'll still produce a, a good quality image with these programs. And the price is certainly right. Price is certainly right. So again, when you ping on color balance, for instance, you get the same types of things. A little bit more sophisticated here, you can see, you can not only adjust the reds, greens, and blues, but you can also adjust where in the image they occur. You can, you can concentrate on shifting the values in the shadow areas, or in the mid-tones, or in the highlights. So it gives you more flexibility. And again, this is, you know, you're tailoring it, you've got, you're using your artistic yeah, sense here to produce the image that you want and so you have finer control in this in terms of in terms of where you go with it. So final suggestion, spend the time and learn your image processing software. Okay, just as I said you, you need to do with your with your cameras, uh, you've got to learn your image processing software, you've got to learn what it can do and what it can't do. And that's why I suggest these, the, you know, the, the freeware and that, it doesn't cost you anything except your time. Uh, and, if you're, and if you're interested in doing that, then practicing it shouldn't be too much of a problem. If you do have questions, you feel free to email me on any of this stuff. Uh, I'll send you a PDF of the, of the slide deck here. And uh, the next time we'll talk about, uh, especially using Earphone View, there's, a, there's something we can use there. If you want to shoot a sequence of, of images over the course of the night aimed at the same part of the sky, next time around I'll show you how to stitch that into a time lapse using, using some very basic programs. Okay, so to end that, uh, I've also combined my observations for tonight with, uh, with my talk here. And so this is a time lapse I shot while I was away doing the solar eclipse. That's the Devil's Tower down at the bottom. And uh, Chris, I'm going to let you run that, otherwise I'll probably blow it.
because I'm split. I need to click on that, but I'll probably. Are you there? Are you there for me? Uh, maybe I'll try. Oh. Ah, oh, damn. Ah! I didn't do that. Did I? I'll let Chris do it. He's the master. There we go. So you can see the Pleiades down at the bottom. It's going to rise up there, and you can see Andromeda almost dead center right now, just below the Milky Way. I will, Chris. No problem. You're the man. There we go. That looks encouraging. There you go. So I spent uh, the, uh, the evening into the early morning hours at the Devil's Tower shooting a number of time lapses. This is one of them. Shows our northern Milky Way rising above the, the tower and the Pleiades there. So again, your choice of foreground is, is just as important as your, as your choice of, of sky objects. And uh, go out and practice, find some cool spots and shoot some sequences there. And next time we'll talk about doing time lapses. Thank you very much. I'm glad I didn't go over time. <laughs> so we're going to take a short break. I'd like to have you back around 8.50. Uh, so we have two things for sale at the break. We're going to have the calendars, $16 for one, $30 for two. And we also have... <laughs> we also have some uh, annual dinner tickets for sale. Now, for these tickets, uh, tonight is the only chance to get them in person. So if you can't get them tonight, uh, you can write an email to Mike Mogadam. If you can't find his email, just write one to me. It'll be my pleasure to help you out. Um, so yeah, these two are for sale tonight. We now accept credit cards, so just at the table over there. Okay, and we'll be giving out uh, door price tickets. We have lots of things tonight. I think there's a Galileo scope down there, so it's really worth it tonight. All right, thank you very much. So we're back. We're going to jump right into our next presentation. So ladies and gentlemen, please give a warm welcome to Danelle. Hello everyone, uh, my name is Danelle Poyakov. I'm 14 years old and I'm really excited about this presentation since it's my first presentation outside of class. Uh, I've actually only been here one time before and I loved it so much that I promised myself I'm gonna present here one day. So here I am and I'm gonna talk about MAVEN, uh, MAVEN's discoveries in Mars. So MAVEN is a NASA space probe that orbits Mars since 2014, and it stands for Mars Atmosphere and Volatile Evolution. So uh, MAVEN is a space probe that was developed by NASA, and it was designed to study the Martian atmosphere while in orbit of Mars. Uh, the mission goals uh, included determining how uh, the, the Martian atmosphere and water, which used to be substantial, how they were lost over time, uh, MAVEN was launched on November 18 uh, of the year 2013, almost uh, four years ago, and it, it was, it's also my birthday, uh, by the Atlas V rocket. Uh, MAVEN's orbit around Mars goes from uh, a perierium, am I pronouncing it right, uh, which is the lowest point of the orbit, uh, from 150 kilometers, as you can see right there, to 6200. Uh, since Phobos, Mars's closest moon, orbits Mars at a distance of only uh, six kilometers, Maven, Maven, uh, Maven was able to see right past it and take this beautiful picture. Um, so on November 13, uh, on November 18 of the year 2013, uh, Maven was launched from Florida and it reached Mars after 10 months in space on the uh, September 22nd of the year 2014. Uh, when it first came close to Mars, it started uh, slowing down. It went into a 35 hour orbit, a way, hard, a way bigger orbit than today's. And after uh, two laps, it went into a five and a half hour orbit. And after a couple of weeks into today's usual four and a half hours. Uh, MAVEN has also done five campaigns called Deep Dip, in which the lowest point of the orbit will go from the usual 150 kilometers to 125 kilometers. Uh, those 25 kilometers may not seem like much, much, but they allow scientists to take measurements from the top of the lower atmosphere. And each of those campaigns will last for uh, five days, which is around 20 orbits. Uh, it was proven that Mars had liquid wa uh, water flowing in its surface by finding riverbeds and minerals on Mars. And it was also proven that Mars had a thick enough atmosphere 
and was warm enough to contain even oceans of water, and Maven has found huge support for those statements. Scientists believe that over millions of years, Mars has lost two-thirds of its atmosphere to space, including water vapor and carbon dioxide. Uh, this process is believed to happen because the, uh, the Martian core, core has cooled down and its magnetosphere ceased to exist, allowing solar winds to strap away the atmosphere. So MAVEN has four main objectives. To determine what changes the loss of volatiles, such as water vapor, uh, nitrogen, and hydrogen to space from uh, the Martian atmosphere has changed through time. So how did you change Mars? And the second objective uh, was to determine uh, the current state of the upper atmosphere, ionosphere, and the atmosphere interaction with the solar wind. Uh, MAVEN has four main objectives, but I will only talk about those two. So let's start with the first one. What the loss of volatile to space from the Martian atmosphere has changed through time. So many scientists believe that Mars used to, have, uh, Mars used to be a warm and a wet planet like today's Earth. So what could have gone so wrong so badly? That brings us to four billion years ago. Uh, it's been proved that Mars had rivers and probably even oceans of water four billion years ago. And it stayed that way for a couple hundreds of millions of years. And about after barely one year, uh, uh, after barely one billion years, after Mars was formed, uh, something changed. Something that transformed Mars from the warm and wet planet it used to be to the cold, dry desert we see today. So how is that big change? Has anything to do with the loss of Martian volatile to space? Well, pretty much everything. Earth's magnetosphere is strong and massive, and it's able to protect Earth from most of the flying objects towards it uh, every second of every day. Mars's magnetosphere was one just like, uh, uh, like Earth's, but after what's believed to be that Mars, Mars's core cooled down, its magnetosphere ceased to exist. And Mars doesn't have a global magnetosphere anymore, but what it does have are small local magnetic fields. What does that mean? Well, one, one thing is, uh, is auroras for everyone. And those are only the visible auroras. Sometimes solar storm can trigger whole, pla whole planet ultraviolet auroras. Um, since Mars lost almost all of its magnetosphere, Mars was way more open to the solar winds. The solar winds used to strike Mars at a speed of 500,000 meters per second, which is about 1.6 million kilometers per hour, an extremely high rate, way higher than today's. What does that mean? Well, imagine just walking and join the view, then millions of little things are coming at you at a speed of 1.2 million kilometers per hour. Not too fun, right? You're probably going to lose all, your, all, your, all of your clothes, just like Mars lost its atmosphere. Uh, MAVEN has proven that Mars lost most of its uh, atmosphere to space, but how much exactly, and how? Earth is losing about three kilos of its atmosphere to space every second. That's nothing compared to, uh, to Earth's size. That's about 340 cups of nitrogen. Mars, as you all should know, is smaller than our home planet by much, and hence it's losing less atmosphere, about 100 grams per second. So in this rate, isn't the Earth supposed to lose its atmosphere before Mars? Well, yes and no. Those rates weren't always so low for Mars. Uh, Four billion years ago, uh, Mars would lose 1,010 times, uh, 10,000 times more atmosphere than it does today. About 100 to 1,000 kilograms of atmosphere every, sec uh, every second. A huge rate, especially for a planet so small. So now is the question of how. How did Mars lose so much of its atmosphere in such a high rate? What stands behind all of this loss? Well, for starters, a young and energetic sun. One of MAVEN's most important discoveries, in my opinion, the most important discovery, is that MAVEN has proven that the main cause for Martian atmospheric loss is solar wind and radiation. The probable cause for the loss of uh, Martian's magnetosphere is that the core cooled down by a bit, and since the sun was still very young, it was way more active, which means way more solar winds and way more radiation. So any planet without a strong and steady magnetic field uh, would lose its atmosphere. So how was a MAVEN able to prove that Mars lost massive magnetosphere to space by solar winds and radiation? One of the ways uh, MAVEN uh, has used is to calculate two different isotopes of argon. Isotopes is the same element, only with a different mass. So MAVEN used argon-36 and argon-38. Since argon is a noble gas, it doesn't chemically react with other materials. So uh, the only way it can get lost uh, to space is by solar winds. So, since argon-38 is uh, heavier than argon-36, it would stay in the lower uh, atmosphere where al while argon-36 would rise up and get, get swept away uh, by the solar winds, leaving his heavier sibling behind on Mars. The numbers show that more than 70% of all argon 
on Mars was lost to space, NASA could then use this information to determine how much of other gases would, would, uh, were lost to space uh, uh, by splattering. Splattering is the loss of space by getting swept away uh, by the solar winds, including carbon dioxide. Carbon dioxide is particularly important because it can warm the planet. After NASA has understood how Mars has lost its atmosphere and what numbers, we can estimate where, what Mars looked like billions of years ago before the, atmosphere, before the atmospheric loss. So now let's go back to the question. Uh, what, uh, what the loss of volatile to space from the Martian atmosphere has changed through time. Today, if you look up with your naked eye, you might see a red dot in the sky. If you're more of a telescope guy, you might look in the telescope and you will still see the same red dot, only bigger, nothing, nothing else. Once, billions of years ago, if you would look up the sky, you would not see the red dot, but maybe something nicer, something even bluish. Um, but not the rusty old planet we see today. You might say, so much lost its atmosphere, so what? I'll tell you what, this is one of the worst things that can ever happen to a planet that might be habitable. It can ruin any chance of, uh, of life on the surface. Why? And uh, what is it that losing the atmosphere changed? Let's start by knowing what Mars looked like billions of years ago. Uh, this is a presentation by NASA, by the way, that NASA made to estimate what Mars looked like billions of years ago by the information he got from AVEN. Um, so how did Mars lose all that water? For starters, when you, uh, the atmosphere, when you start losing atmosphere, you start losing heat faster as carbon dioxide goes away. Uh, and after a while, the atmospheric pressure is so low, water starts to evaporate at lower temperatures. And as it gets in the atmosphere, radiation breaks it down to hydrogen and oxygen, and those get swept away from the Martian atmosphere, and they get lost from the planet forever. In short, it ruined any chances of life on the surface. If you can recall, the second of Maven's objective was to uh, determine the current state of the upper atmosphere, atmosphere and the atmosphere interaction with the solar winds. Maven has made a couple of experiments. One of them is to measure how much gases are lost in space today. Three of them are carbon, oxygen, and hydrogen. Hydrogen, being the lightest element, tends to, uh, tends to rise up far in the atmosphere and gets swept away way easier uh, to space, forever lost to the planet. Um, Sorry. Uh, it's believed uh, that the same amount of gas was lost to space throughout an entire Martian year, but MAVEN me uh, measurements has shown that when the planet is the closest to the sun, it would lose 10 times the amount of gas it would lose when it's the furthest away, uh, helping to prove the fact that uh, most of the atmospheric loss is caused due to solar winds and radiation. The Martian ionosphere is a layer of gas that is very high up above the Martian ground. About, uh, for, it extends from 75 miles to a couple of hundred miles. Uh, above the, the Martian surface. So one day in 2014, Maven was just cruising around enjoying the view and a spectacular sighting spring comet that had just passed Mars at a distance of 80,000 kilometers. Uh, when Maven started to enjoy the comet, its ultra-sensitive neutral gas and ion mass spectrometer, nailed it, has disturbed it because apparently there is something around it. Maven, being in an, an unusually low orbit, told NASA that there are metal ions in the atmosphere. Now, uh, that was a really big surprise for NASA, since, Earth and, uh, b since there's only one big way that you can get metal ions in the atmosphere, and that's by the constant contact of small meteorites with the atmosphere. And as the meteorites burn up, uh, uh, the atmosphere would rip electrons from the metal atoms, turning them into positively charged ions. Mm, and since the Martian atmosphere doesn't have its magnetosphere to protect it from the solar winds, uh, Mars, uh, NASA didn't uh, think they would stick around, but after three years of uh, Maven keep telling him the same results, that the number don't change, uh, NASA realized that those metal ions are the same ones that were there uh, when the Martian atmosphere was uh, thicker. But that's not the important part, because that's already been proven. Before Maven detected those ions, the dynamics of Mars Mars's upper atmosphere were pretty much invisible, which makes gravity waves or a phenomenon like atmospheric loss uh, really hard to study. But now it's like dropping ink in water. You can see which way the current moves. Uh, that was said by uh, Ben, uh, atmospheric astronaut at NASA. Now a couple of uh, discoveries of MAVEN that I, think, uh, uh, that I think are really cool. One of them is that MAVEN has discovered that some particles from the solar wind, uh, winds were able to penetrate unexpectedly deep into the Martian atmosphere. Another discovery of MAVEN's that I think is really cool is that the fact that MAVEN has identified two new types of auroras, named diffuse and proton auroras, and unlike how we think of our, uh, most auroras on Earth, 
those auroras are completely unrelated to a global, to a global or a local magnetic field. So in conclusion with this entire presentation, if you want to see auroras, go to Mars. Uh, oh yeah, I almost forgot. On September 12 of 2017, Maven has viewed the, the brightest aurora ever on record on Mars. As, as you can see, it was 25 times brighter than the prior brightest and in an uh, altitude of only 60 kilometers. So now to the actual conclusion. So MAVEN is an NASA space uh, Mars satellite that was launched in 2013. It keeps on orbiting Mars since 2014. Uh, its, its goal was to determine how the atmosphere and water, uh, which used to be substantial, how they were lost over time. And those were lost by splattering, which MAVEN has proved by calculating two different isotopes of argon. The upper atmosphere is still losing gases uh, today, but way less than before. Uh, it's losing mainly hydrogen, and the rates are higher when the planet is closer to the sun. Uh, the ionosphere has metal ions uh, of iron, sodium, and magnesium in it. And like I said before, Mars is one big overall machine. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Dana. Um, so next up, we've got Jim Thompson with, I believe, the Great American Eclipse. Don't bang it. Well, that's going to be a tough act to follow, my goodness. Uh, well, we, a couple months ago, had a, an evening dedicated to the eclipse, and everybody was super excited to present their photos of the eclipse that uh, I thought I would save this talk about the journey around the eclipse uh, for a later date. So uh, here we go. Okay, so there are many reasons to go on this trip. The main one being that neither myself nor my family had actually seen a total solar eclipse before. And the fact that it was in North America meant that I could bring my whole family reasonably affordably. And I'm not going to fly them to South Africa or something. So, so this is a great opportunity. I didn't want to miss it. Another thing was that it happened in August, which meant my kids were already out of school, my wife's on vacation, so the timing really couldn't be any better. Another thing was that the American Southwest and other parts of the U.S. affected by the eclipse are really fascinating areas to see. There's lots of uh, sites, lots of natural phenomena and things that, that are really exciting uh, to take your family to see. And uh, my family has been pestering me for years to take them somewhere, so this is finally a chance to get them off my back. <laughs> so the first step was to figure out where I wanted to watch the eclipse from. And as we know, it made a, the path of the totality went pretty much across the entire United States. So there's lots of places to pick. And there's a lot of resources online, uh, there's people around the world that have been hunting this eclipse for, for years and years. So uh, lots of online uh, data available on weather patterns and clouds. Uh, I use the greatamericaneclipse.com quite a lot. The, uh, this particular graph is from that website. And the blue areas are areas of a lower probability of clouds in August. So that's kind of the area that I was concentrating on. But I also wanted to pick an area that was relatively close to a lot of other interesting things to see. So in this case, I chose Casper, Wyoming, which is shown by the star. There. So once I've decided where I needed to be on the 21st of August, I planned the rest of the trip around that. So the objective as I mentioned, was to try to see as many landmarks, national parks, uh, interesting things as we could along the journey. 
and I wanted to keep it a reasonable length of time as you know, the kids did have to go back to school on Labor, after Labor Day, so I had to kind of keep it in a window of time. I also knew that I wanted to rent an RV and camp our way around this journey uh, because it allows us to see a lot more of the countryside. You know, driving from place to place, uh, camping outdoors. You know, my family is a camping family, so that's, that's kind of the way I wanted to do it. I also wanted to include San Francisco. Uh, my wife and I went there for my 40th birthday and had an amazing time. It's a really incredible city to visit and I knew that I wanted to bring my kids there someday. So I knew I wanted to, at some point, be in San Francisco. And the end result was an 18-day trip lasting from the 11th to the 28th. The uh, plan was to fly into Las Vegas to pick up the RV and then drive our way through Arizona, Utah, skip across Colorado up to Casper, and then after the eclipse, work our way back through Wyoming, Idaho, Nevada, back to San Francisco. So that was the plan. Now, me being a little bit selfish, I also wanted to make this sort of astronomy-focused trip. The areas that we were driving through, a lot of them are some of the darkest parts of North America uh, that there are. For example, through, um, like through Nevada, where there is basically nothing. Um, even the southern Utah, northern Arizona, and up through Wyoming are very, very dark parts of the, uh, the US. And it provided um, potentially a great opportunity to do some deep sky observing with my family. Like, skies that we're not really used to around here. Hello? I broke it. There we go. Another thing that was happening around the same time was the Perseid meteor shower. It was actually supposed to peak on our second evening uh, of our trip. And we were going to be in northern Arizona at the time, which seemed like a great opportunity to see the Perseids under dark skies as opposed to Ottawa skies. Flicker is great. Uh, another thing in northern Arizona I wanted to see was the Behringer Meteor Crater. Um, I've seen it before, but going there with my kids and showing them and how amazing it is to see this mile diameter hole in the ground. Uh, I thought it would be a r really interesting thing to do on our trip. And while in that part of the world, we were also going to see the Lowell Observatory in, uh, in Flagstaff, Arizona. Another great um, facility, a real professional observatory that we could check out while we were there. And then of course, the uh, total solar eclipse was on the list of things to do. So I've kind of broke the trip, the 18 days, up into groups of days. Um, I'll talk a little bit and then there'll be a bit of a slideshow, just to kind of carry you through the trip. Um, I took only about uh, 4,200 photos uh, while we were away. I won't show all of them tonight, but uh, this is just a, a selection of a few. So we started in Los Angeles and um, made our way uh, Across the Hoover Dam, which is the first star here, uh, across northern Arizona to the Flagstaff area, and our first uh, camping night was at Behringer Meteor Crater. It's kind of cool, the RV park right there. And then made our way up through Flagstaff, Lowell Observatory, to the Grand Canyon, and then up and spent a couple of days at Lake Powell. Get the slideshow to work here. You can do it. I'm pointing it right at your face, your face Chris. It's all right. You want to say next? <laughs> well, the problem is there's a couple of sequences, but so this is the vehicle that we rented. It's from a company called Escape. Um, it's basically just a panel van, but it's been outfitted with uh, bench seats that break down into a queen size bed in the inside. So two people slept inside. There's a pop up on the roof. Two of us slept up top. We had to rotate 
to make my family happy. Not always up top. Um, and then the back doors open up and there's a kitchenette there with a fridge and a propane stove. So it was actually kind of very compact, but everything that we needed for our journey. So this is the view leaving uh, Las Vegas. Um, the Hoover Dam was really quite, quite amazing, but incredibly hot as well. We couldn't stand the heat there. It's about 110. This is the Behringer Meteor Crater with my family. We got there 20 minutes before it closed, uh, but still plenty of time to, to see the, the really neat crater. And we were, uh, our timing was perfect as we were leaving to catch this really amazing sunset. It was all uh, thunderstorms that day. It was terrible driving, actually. The roads were awful. Thunderstorms, lightning was striking on the sides of the road as we were driving. It was kind of scary. But right at the end of the day, we caught this amazing sunset where the sun dropped below the thunder clouds and shone across and lit up the whole landscape. It was quite, quite amazing. And um, unfortunately, because of the clouds, we couldn't see the Perseid meteor shower, but hey, that's all right. So the next day, we drove to Flagstaff to see the Lowell Observatory. I was very impressed by the facility. Um, you can kind of do a self-guided tour if you want. There's lots of interesting uh, artifacts to see, uh, lovely kept gardens. Um, there's even uh, Percival Lowell's mausoleum. He's like, he's actually lying right there. Uh, and lots of professional telescopes. Research is still being done there today with, with some of these instruments. It's quite, quite impressive. And uh, we finished our day there with a guided tour taking us through the history of the discovery of Pluto. And this is the, the telescope where Pluto, the, the, uh, the image plates were taken on the telescope in this dome that discovered Pluto. So that was kind of cool. So a very amazing facility. I, I would go back there again. It was quite impressive. So from there, it was a fairly quick drive north up to the Grand Canyon. Um, my wife and I had seen it before, but um, it still is uh, breathtaking to me. Your, your, your brain almost can't handle the, the distances. And then the following day, we, uh, we did a boat tour on Lake Powell, which is a man-made lake, um, the second largest man-made lake in the US. We saw some other sites like Horseshoe Bend Canyon, uh, the uh, Slot Canyon, Antelope Canyon, where the flash floods have molded the sandstone on all these amazing, amazing patterns. It was really uh, quite, uh, quite scenic that, those first couple of days. The, um, the walk through this canyon uh, was about a kilometer long, and it was about 100 degrees, I guess. Um, so it was a little bit challenging, but uh, it was still, it was definitely worth it. So the, uh, I was hoping to see dark skies when we were there, and, and we did, but I didn't anticipate how dark they were. So Lake Powell is down here. It's quite a large lake. It follows the, the Colorado River, and it's right on the border between uh, Arizona down here at the bottom and Utah. Now, our campground was just outside of Page, Arizona, about um, maybe 10 miles out of town. And I thought, oh, we're close to town. It's not going to be all that great. But the, um, the first night we arrived, it was dark. And it was um, so dark that the light cast from the Milky Way was casting shadows on the ground. And we didn't need flashlights to set up our camp or anything. It was, I'd, I've never seen... Uh, a sky that dark before. And of course, because of that, I had to t take some pictures. So this is a single frame, 30 seconds from my uh, Canon M3 mirrorless ISO 6400, just with a seven millimeter fisheye lens uh, looking south. And you can see there's a little bit of sky glow from Page, but otherwise the horizon all the way around was just black, right to the horizon. And it was so dark, in fact, that you could see sky glow. Uh, this is looking north. This is our, our little our ride here. But the greenish glow here is, uh, I believe, it's sky glow. So it's um, oxygen in the upper atmosphere that's been uh, hit 
by solar radiation and it's uh, become ionized and it's giving off that glow. I've never seen that before. I've never been in that dark a sky before. So that was pretty amazing. And it was cool because my son had his GoPro out and he was beside me and we are look at the sky and my wife's like, are you guys going to bed yet? And, you know, it was a lot of fun evenings spent enjoying the sky. I think there's one more shot here looking straight overhead. Yeah, it's straight overhead. So that's a sing just a single 30 second frame. So we were in the page area for about two days and then we drove um, kind of in a westerly direction towards Zion National Park. And we made a stop in this uh, coral, coral pink sand dunes area, which was really quite amazing. I knew that they said it was pink, but coral pink, but it was really coral pink. It was, and it was super soft. It was like walking on cheesy dust. So it was uh, kind of a neat little stop. We had our lunch there, went for a walk around the sand dunes. It was a n nice little stop along the way to, uh, to Zion National Park, which if you've never been there, is, it's one of the most amazing parks I've been to. You literally drive down into this half mile deep canyon with steep walls on either side. And the, par the park is in the bottom and we went on a hiking trail. It was about a six hour hike up the side basically switchbacks up the side of the canyon wall to get to the top. So this is the very top of the canyon, 2,600 feet from the base. And uh, yeah, the view is just astounding. So this, this was one of my, my favorite days. We were dead tired at the end because it was around 100 degrees, um, but it was, it was totally worth it. So an, an amazing day. And that night, uh, similarly dark skies, but the transparency was n noticeably not as good. I think we were into an area with a little bit more humidity, but I tried to take a few shots regardless, trying to get the, uh, the canyon walls in the background. So that's one with the, uh, our camper in the background, and then another one just with uh, some of the cliff walls and the, uh, the Milky Way stretching across. So that's another just 30 second single frame shot. So from there, we skirted our way across Utah. We saw Bryce Canyon. We were gonna do another hike here, but we were so tired from the day before. We just kind of went and said, yeah, that's nice. Okay, let's keep going. Um, and we drove across, um, I believe this was in uh, Capitol Reef National Park, another area, and then into the Moab area, into Arches National Park. These are images from Arches National Park. Uh, just um, astounding landscapes. It's really, the pictures don't do it justice. Uh, we also spent a half a day at a dinosaur park, just to, to change pace. Yeah, I, I was okay. I came away uninjured from that experience, so you don't need to worry. Uh, but yeah, this was actually the only dinosaur track museum in the world, I think is what they were touting. I don't know how accurate that was, but uh, but fascinating, they, they had all these real fossilized dinosaur tracks and then they associate it with an animal and they had uh, replicas there for you to look at and read information on. It was pretty, pretty, pretty well done. And the, one of the nights in the Moab area, I had an opportunity to do some more deep sky related observing. So this, these are all images taken with the rig that I brought down to do the eclipse with. So it's a small 135 millimeter focal length lens, um, monochrome video camera meant for planetary work, but it was sensitive enough to do some deep sky. And I just kind of went through all my summer, summer favorites. So this is the Trifid Nebula, M17, the Swan. I especially like the way the, um, the, the, the much fainter nebulosity came out here that you wouldn't normally see if you looked at this object in the city. Um, M16, the Eagle. Again, lots of faint nebulosity extending around the perimeter. It was kind of neat to see. And then uh, the final one was um, IC5146, the Cocoon Nebula, along with the, the dark nebula that it sits within. I always thought this looked like a, a spoon with some candy on it or something. It's kind of a, a, an interesting combination object. So once we were done in Moab, we made a, 
a two-day push to get to Casper. We had two days to get there. And luckily, the drive across Colorado and southern Wyoming was all really easy going. It was uh, light traffic. The highways are pretty much just dead straight across open plains. Uh, you could see a car coming about 10 miles away, so passing was no problem. And uh, a little bit of traffic when we got close to Casper, but other otherwise it was fine. It was great driving. Great, great weather, no rain, nothing. And the, uh, we weren't actually right in Casper. We were in a RV park j just outside of town on the east side called the River's Edge. And I, I booked a place here in January and they were almost full. Um, so very, very busy time for them. And um, initially when we arrived, I wasn't too impressed by our site. If I can get the clicker to work. Oh, there it is. Oop, too far. So our site was a hard-packed um, white stone field. I had to use a hammer to drive a stake in, it was so hard, uh, with a little square pad of uh, fake grass. But it, in the end, it actually worked out just fine. The, uh, the people next to us were super friendly. We got along really well. Um, and we were actually, the picture of the, the river was uh, about 50 feet away from, from our van. So the actual area around the campsite was quite nice. It just where we were camping was a little bit rudimentary. But it was really super friendly people. They were really good hosts. They put on a, uh, a uh, southern barbecue supper that night for anybody who wanted to, to to pay, and it was a very reasonable price. So we, you know, gorged ourselves on uh, brisket and barbecue chicken, and it was delicious. And uh, later, after supper, uh, Vic Maris, he's the owner of uh, Stellar View Telescopes. He was there, and he gave uh, a very nice talk about uh, just astronomy in general and about what to expect of the eclipse the next day. And uh, he has this little gag that he does, and you can see in the picture here, he dresses up as Galileo Galilei, and he comes out and he answers questions from the perspective of Galileo, which was kind of, kind of funny. Um, but yeah, great, great talk, very, very animated fellow. Um, so a great, great evening, uh, really set the mood for the next day. Uh, there was also a breakfast put on, and they had eggs and bacon, and you can see the cinnamon roll there the size of my son's head. He really liked that. Um, good start to the morning, and uh, it was a beautiful day when we got up. Beautiful blue sky, a little bit of cloud off in the distance, and uh, where hopes were high of, of good weather. Uh, I set up with two cameras. They were all automated off to the side. I didn't really have to do anything. The blue one is... Uh, just has a fisheye lens. It was just trying to record the shadow coming over and everybody's activity. I think I showed the videos from these a couple of months ago. And the other was a tracking mount uh, with the lens and the camera and a calcium K filter in it. So the, uh, the whole experience was quite amazing. You know, the, there's a level of excitement in the air. Everybody's really energized especially as it got darker and darker and the temperature um, before things really started to happen it was probably in the high 90s and by the time we got into the eclipse it was probably dipped down close to seven, the 70s so quite a dramatic change uh, in the temperature it was really uh, added to the excitement it kind of sent chills through your spine uh, literally because you were cold um, and the uh, response of everybody around you as the totality came through, everybody was cheering and some people were kind of almost weeping because it was kind of overwhelming and uh, I really f felt kind of a hair stand up in the back of my neck when it all happened. It was really something to, 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 to be there and, and witness and I hope my children also kind of experienced the same thing that I experienced. After the eclipse, things kind of went downhill for a little bit. <laughs> because once the eclipse was done, everybody decided it was time to go home. 
And uh, the highways in Wyoming, you know, they're excellent highways, excellent quality, but they are not meant to handle a lot of volume. So this is uh, a traffic jam uh, trying to enter Shoshone, and I think Denny knows where that is. A uh, little, little crossroads uh, that has like a four-way stop. And four-way stops don't work when you have thousands of cars all trying to go in one direction. So that delayed us probably about an hour getting to our destination, but that was okay. We had snacks in the car, the kids had their tablets, everything was fine. But it was just kind of like, okay, well, I hope things clear up by the next day. So that night, we stayed in Thermopolis, um, which is a town with a natural mineral spring, and we had time to go for supper and to go into a local pool that was all filled with the mineral water from the spring, so that was kind of cool. Got a good night's rest and then made our way up to Yellowstone National Park, where we took two days to drive around the entire outer perimeter of the park and saw a number of, of sites along the way before making our way across uh, to Idaho. So if I can say anything about Yellowstone, it's that they have a lot of buffalo. <laughs> and the buffalo go wherever they want. <laughs> uh, but beautiful landscapes, uh, sort of mountain meadows, lots of thermal features like these uh, cascaded springs, lots of, of uh, geysers and things. Really fascinating to see. It might not seem interesting, but when you're there and the smell of sulfur in the air, it's kind of cool. I think you're in, you're in a caldera of a super volcano. And of course, when you're there, you have to see Old Faithful. This is Old Faithful. Uh, we only had to wait about 20 minutes before the next eruption, so our timing was pretty good, along with about uh, 5,000 other people. <laughs> um, so my hopes from the previous day that the traffic would be okay the next day was, were, was gone. The traffic was actually horrible uh, in the park. I think because the eclipse path was so close to Yellowstone, everybody decided, let's go to Yellowstone for vacation this week. And so we were in bumper bumper traffic in the middle of nowhere, basically in the park. In wilderness, we were in bumper to bumper traffic just because of the volume of people trying to get through the park. Some people got irritated uh, and were complaining about it. We overheard people complaining to the rangers and things, but I think you had to have, had to have the right attitude say, you know, it doesn't change the fact that you're in this beautiful place, you know, just enjoy it. So, so we did. So from, uh, from Yellowstone, we made our way south past the Grand Tetons National Park. Uh, lovely mountain range, uh, very uh, Canadian Rockies-esque looking mountains. Uh, we didn't really stop, we just kind of made our way by, but there's lots of neat pullouts to just kind of enjoy the view and take some photos. And fr from there we made our, our way through uh, Jackson Hole to, uh, into Idaho. And it was interesting because we were basically following the path of the totality days after the event. And when we met people in the stores and at the gas stations and things, they had a lot of interesting stories to tell us about what the experience was like from them, people who live and work there, being during the totality. Uh, some people, they weren't very happy about it. <laughs> Other people thought it was really exciting. So it was kind of a neat uh, part of the trip that I didn't anticipate, meeting all these people after the fact. People who had survived the Great Eclipse. <laughs> um, this is uh, scenes from Idaho. Uh, lots of farming there. We stopped at an area called Craters of the Moon. It's a, a large, uh, recently um, active volcanic region. Um, lots of cinder cones and lava fields and lava tubes we could hike through. Uh, quite a bizarre landscape actually to see. Uh, it's like miles and miles of just lava. The most recent eruption was about 2,000 years ago. Um, and some of the older cinder cones that have the, the trees on them, they're more like 5,000 years old. So just a really interesting uh, place to have a little pit stop and to camp. We camp there that, that night before moving on. So it was pretty neat to see. Oops, sorry. Okay. Hey, were all the lava tubes glass? Some were, some weren't. The, the picture, there was a picture there showing a cave. That was one that we walked through. It was 800 feet long, and we were able to hike through the whole length of it. 
parts of it you had to kind of scramble to get through, but it was, it was really, really neat. Uh, our last night in Idaho was kind of a great uh, breather. We were able to do laundry, have showers. Uh, we ordered takeout food from the campground. It was really slick, actually. They delivered it right to our campsite in a little buggy. Um, and I thought it was kind of neat when I sat there and the kids were in the pool to look up and see the moon now, kind of almost a week later, come across the other side of the sun. You know, I just saw you, you know, on the 21st, and, and there you are again. That was kind of kind of neat. Ooh. Sorry, that's a secret. I wasn't supposed to see that. So the the longest drive, the big drive to Reno. It was, I believe, 900 kilometers we drove in one day, which it seems like a long drive, and it, and it was actually a long drive. <laughs> but uh, luckily, it was all highway driving. Like this interstate, the speed limit was 80 miles an hour, miles an hour. Uh, so it made good time along here. And it was actually neat to see all this area in Idaho was all f farming, very fertile land because of the it's a rift valley, so lots of volcanic activity for millions of years, so the soil is very rich. Um, and the landscape is not that different as you come into Nevada, but this is all irrigated up here. They, they have water here to irrigate. Every field we passed had irrigation going, like, no matter what time of day it was. And here, there was no irrigation and there was no farming. Some cattle, but otherwise just desert the whole way down all the way down to Reno, and we, we re rewarded ourselves for our long day's drive by having a delicious, authentic, uh, no, it doesn't work, <laughs> authentic Mexican meal. And it was delicious, I have to say. So, our last day of driving, day 16, was by far the worst day of driving I've had in my entire life. <laughs> it combined windy roads with lots of hilly terrain, with terrible conditioned highways. Apparently the state is almost broke, so no money is going into infrastructure. Uh, very poor signage um, and tons and tons of traffic. So uh, the whole drive from Reno like th this is all mountains through here, so mountain passes and things. Tons of transport trucks, and the trucks have worn grooves into the highway, so you ca can't change lanes because the grooves are holding in the lane. It's just kind of terrifying. Um, and then just when it flattens out and we get into nice smooth highway, you get into the traffic from Sacramento. And then all the way down into uh, Napa, Napa Valley here, the traffic was just horrible, bumper to bumper, until we got off into country roads and then it's all winding up and down and kind of crazy driving. No signs. We got totally lost at one point. We were supposed to be heading this way and we were heading that way. Uh, but eventually we got to where we were trying to get that day and that was the uh, Point Reyes National Seashore. And it was uh, totally worth the, uh, the effort to get there. Uh, the view of the Pacific Ocean was, was uh, quite amazing. And my, my family really enjoyed being able to play in the surf. As we were uh, leaving Point Reyes, got a really nice sunset. And then uh, just as we entered San Francisco, a great view of the Golden Gate Bridge just before the sun went down. So that all worked out after a day of difficult driving, a nice finish. The following day, we returned our vehicle and used public transit to explore San Francisco. Had a great day there and, and then flew back on the 18th day. So a few uh, just tidbits of, of numbers. The highest point we reached on a whole trip was uh, pretty much in the middle of Utah, uh, very close to something called the Hog's Back, and it was around 9,600 feet above the sea level. By the way, if you ever in Utah, uh, Utah 12 is uh, challenging drive, but amazing scenes. There's uh, the variation in the terrain. Is it's just it's just amazing, amazing drive. We traveled uh, 8,600 kilometers by air and about 5,500 by van. We burned 
670 liters of fuel. We ate four boxes of rice aroni, the San Francisco treat. And uh, we drank about 160 liters of juice, rice, um, water, Gatorade. We tried to drink as much as we could the whole trip. So the, um, you know, we joke about it, but really I, I think it ended up being better than I could have expected. Uh, everybody got along on the trip. Um, we all have memories. We all even still talk about, oh, remember when we saw this, remember when we saw that. So uh, um, the whole thing worked out a lot better than, than I expected. Even the logistics of the van rental and everything, it just worked out really great. So I'm really happy that we did the trip. Even if it was a cloudy day on Eclipse Day, I think we still would have uh, been happy that we had gone. So now the only question that remains is, uh, where are we going to go next? Thank you. Here. Oh, am I next? So next up, uh, oh. we have a few observations. If we can get it to work. Yeah, yeah. you have to point it right at Chris's head. Uh. Chris. He fell asleep. Hit the wrong button again. Oh. There you go. That's me. Okay, I don't know if, uh, it's probably hard to remember about a month ago when we had a stretch of eight contiguous days of clear sky starting on September 10th. I don't know if you can remember that far back, the, all the rains maybe clogged your memory. But uh, I, I uh, was able to observe six out of eight of those days, most of them observations at night, but on the 10th, uh, I did some solar observing. And uh, these are some of the shots that I took that day. Um, in four different wave bands. And something that really popped out at me was uh, this particular prominence right here. If we take a closer look, try to take a closer look. It was a very well-defined loop prominence. And I actually saw initially in the infrared image, which is something I have never seen before. I have never seen a prominence so bright that it shows up in infrared. So I, I immediately went back, I actually went calcium K, solar continuum, near infrared, and said, holy mackerel, what's that? And went back to calcium K to get the, um, the prominence in calcium K, which you can get sometimes, but not all the time. It has to be quite bright and then finished up with looking at it in H-alpha. And it, it's one of the most amazing prominences that I've seen. Um, now, is the video right after this, Chris? Yes. It is? Okay. So it was so amazing that I took about an hour and a half, two hours, to just take a, a snippet of 100 frames every minute. And I boiled that all down into this time lapse. So if, uh, it's probably best if you start it. So the blurriness, every occasional frame, is because the seeing was really, really bad. This was around 3 in the afternoon, and uh, the seeing was quite bad. But you can see what, what is termed as uh, coronal rain. So this is material that's actually, that's actually falling back down to the surface, which is pretty, pretty incredible. I've never observed uh, a prominent. I've seen you know, videos of it online, but I've never actually observed with my own telescope something that, that cool. Yeah, that was pretty neat. Anybody want to see it again? See it again? Yeah. <laughs> Please. You said that was out of the space of an hour or so? Yes, that was a, uh, it's one frame every minute, and I think there's about 70, 75 frames there, so about a, a, an hour and 15 minutes. That was captured with my, um, my f6.3 four inch refractor. But I believe I had it, I might have had a two times barrel on at the time. So anyway, I was quite, quite pleased with the way that turned out.
But it was quite laborious to put that together. I followed uh, Simon's methodology, but uh, because everything is moving and the seeing was poor, I had to basically manually align every frame, all 75 frames. So that took a little bit of time. And then uh, with the same day, that evening, uh, I captured uh, this lunar image. It's actually a mosaic captured with the same refractor. I believe it's about uh, 12 individual images uh, put together in a mosaic. And that's it. Thank you. Okay, so we are all out of time, so I'm gonna zoom through these final announcements. Uh, so we are having some winter FLO members only star parties at these dates. Of course, we'll be sending out uh, reminders. Um, Howard Simcover is going to be giving a talk at the Ottawa Field Naturalist Club um, about meteors and meteorites. So that is at um, the Central Experimental Farm at 7.30 p.m. on Tuesday, November 14th. Estelle's Pick of the Month is a Black Hole Blues and Other Songs from Outer Space um, by Jan 11. It's a very, very recent book. It was released at the end of 2016, and it's about the discovery of gravitational waves. And this is an award-winning author. She's very, very good. So membership, um, You've got regular family youth memberships uh, that can all be done online. Uh, benefits include the Ted Bean Telescope Library, the Stan Mod Book Library. The book library is behind the stage in the storage room, so after the meeting, if you'd like to go borrow a book, it's right behind there. And uh, access to the grounds of the Fred Lossing Observatory. You also get these publications, um, Sky News, the Journal, Observer's Handbook, and Astronauts Online. Club information. And all of our meetings are webcast um, online on Ustream, RASC Ottawa Live, and you can find the recordings on the website. So audience 108, thank you very much. Uh, thank you to all the speakers. And uh, as usual, we'll be meeting at Gracie's after the meeting. Um, you go down Aviation Parkway, turn right on Ogilvy, you can't miss it, it's right there. Um, so thank you for joining us. Thank you for those who joined online, and I hope you have a great evening.